right. Well, good morning, guys. How's everybody? Well, it's good to see everybody here again today. How's everybody doing? Well, guys, glad that you're here today. Well, guys, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your gracious love towards us in that while we were still yet sinners, that Christ came and died for us. Lord, we come before you with open hearts and with minds that wish to absorb your word. I pray that you might help me and help us to see you, to know you, and that we might be more like you. So, Lord, till the soil of our hearts that your word might be planted, that we might have a better picture of who you are, and that we might be the kind of people that would bear fruit for you. So I pray that you might help us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in Hebrews chapter 5, moving along at lightning pace. Uh, I'm going to finish up a little bit of 4 because we didn't get to do it last week, and it's one of my favorite verses is in there. But chapter 5 is going to be about our high priest. Now, those of you who have come out of the Jewish faith uh, don't have a high priest anymore. So ever since 70 AD, when the Romans tore down the temple, the whole sacrificial system and the priesthood has been annihilated. But it is being rebuilt, actually, in Jerusalem. Uh, pray for those folks, by the way. It's hard to not be glued to the TV with everything that's going on. And uh, I've been praying seemingly all, all the, every third breath I'm, I'm praying for them. But uh, they're getting ready to rebuild the temple and the Antichrist to eventually come. So that's all going to happen in the, the seven years of tribulation. <laughs> So uh, we are getting closer and closer to the return of the Lord, if you have not noticed. And when things get worse and worse, I say, oh, no, things are getting worse and worse. And the Lord says, uh-huh. And I go, oh, yeah, that has to happen before you come back. I get it. And so we don't mourn as those who have no hope. Amen? Amen. So we're going to be in chapter 5. Uh, interesting passage here in chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Though he was a son, speaking of Jesus Christ, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. It's a very interesting scripture because Jesus, being God, the son of God, how can he learn? How can God learn anything? Doesn't it make you just go? Hmm. Good. I'm not the only one. Previously, we were in chapter 4, and I'll, I'll just do a very quick summation on what we talked about. It was about rest. If you guys remember, it was talking about the Sabbath and what that was created to be, and there's the rest in which Canaan was a representation of in which they were not able to enter because they didn't have faith. There's the rest that God has because after six days on the seventh day, he... He rested from all the work that he had done. And I asked you a trick question. How long was the seventh day? We're still in it. It doesn't say that there was, there was evening and morning and a, 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 an eighth day. It doesn't say that. And most people just did a quick reading who just missed that. But the seventh day is today. And so when the Lord asks us to come into his rest, it's about entering the rest that he himself is in. And God doesn't worry about anything, does he? Because he already knows everything. And if he wants to change some of the pieces on the board, he does it, doesn't he? So I take comfort in that, that God is sovereign above all things. The theme of Hebrews is that Jesus is better than all of these things. And the, the writer of Hebrews has made a good job of making sure that we understand that Jesus is greater than all of these things. Trying to encourage the Christians who have come out of the Jewish faith and the sacrificial system and the priesthood and the temple worship to not go back to that because Jesus is the fulfillment of all of what that is a shadow and a picture of. And so if you left that, then you're leaving the reality for a shadow. So this week, we're going to talk about him being our high priest. We're going to see two of the seven warnings in Hebrews. We're going to hopefully get through four and go to five. We talked about what rest really is, 
and that we should be careful that we don't enter into it. And just so that you understand, it's about sanctification, not salvation. It's not like we have to work and do and make sure that we do all this to get saved. It's now that we are saved, we can also miss out on our inheritance. Our inheritance is not heaven, by the way. Our inheritance is living a victorious life. It's living the kind of a life where we rest from our own labors, trying to be good enough before God, a system in which says, you know, you have to work yourself up to be good. Most people believe in that, right? You've heard about the scales in heaven, well, if, if I get to heaven and my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I'll go to heaven. Well, who told you that? What, what book did you read that from? What authoritative figure did you hear that from? Oh, I just figured that's my religion. I just made it up. That would be honest. But most people say, well, isn't that the way it works? That's not the way it works. And if my bad deeds outweigh my good deeds, then I'll go to the other place. And they don't want to say the other place. I don't know. You ever talk to people and get that? I'm not the only one, right? Good. It's about entering into the rest, the rest that God has for us. And there's a problem with people in church. Really? People in church? Yeah, people in church is a problem because we are some of the best educated Bible literate people that you'll be able to find. The problem is if it's just words and it's not accompanied by action, It means nothing. If I told you uh, the towers were under attack on 9-11 and you did nothing, you would be a victim, a victim of not listening. It's not that you weren't told. And so we run the risk of the same thing when we know so much more than we do. Any of you feel that tension that you know more than Jonathan and I know? It's just Jonathan and I. Because we're such a well-informed people with the internet, with our phones in our pockets, with uh, books galore, uh, you know, just go on Amazon and it'll come to you like a Christmas present. You can unwrap it. But if we don't do anything about it, it's not going to profit us at all. If we don't mix it with faith, James chapter 2 goes into that because faith without works is dead. It's not real faith. Faith is living. It actually produces something. There's evidence, right? Right? Be careful, because if you don't enter into the rest, you may end up falling dead in the desert, like all of the folks did in uh, the Old Testament. When Israel came out of Egypt and they were led out, they go scan out the land, see what it's like. Oh, it's great, but there are giants. We can't go there. We, we look like grasshoppers next to them. In our own eyes, that we're grasshoppers. And so they didn't go. And so instead of going in after 40 days of looking, they ended up wandering through the desert for 40 years. And they never entered into that rest. By the way, Canaan isn't a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the victorious life that God has for us. It's about our inheritance, which is living a life where we're not controlled by sin any longer, but by the spirit of God, where we can do wonderful exploits for the Lord. Amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but when I get to speak up for God or, or reach out to somebody who doesn't know him and I get to represent him, it's exciting. If you want to know what it is to be in the victorious life, you need to get it out on the field instead of sitting on the bench, right? Because what a blessing it is. And I can tell you, that's the kind of thing you want to be involved in. And so we talked about God's rest, that the Sabbath, it, the seventh day is God's rest. And he didn't stop resting, not even until now. He didn't create anything new other than in you and I through the Holy Spirit. That he makes new still. We talked about mixing it with faith and stepping out and not being like the people in Numbers 13 and 14 where you see yourself as a grasshopper as opposed to God sees you as a victorious people. And what happens when we enter into his rest is we stop from our own works, that celestial scale where, well, if I did a good enough job, then I'll go to heaven. Well, that's like playing Jenga, you know, it just stuck. It's not going to amount to much. It all falls down, right? And inevitably, we all try to do good things, right? How many of you are currently trying to lose weight? Okay, good. How many of you are trying to gain weight? Can we arrange a transfusion, perhaps? Might be good. 
We're always trying to better ourselves and we've got self-help books and it's a multi-billion dollar business and it's all about self-help and yet people are still trying to help themselves and they're still just as messed up. You know, people are still making New Year's resolutions. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. If the Lord doesn't come and take us home, you will get through into 2024. You'll get to the next year. And then what? The resolutions. No more cake. No more sugar. I'm going to stop this and this and this and this. That's great. And then comes the first. <laughs> Within the first 10 days, 83% of those people completely lose it and go back to the people they were. So self-help doesn't work. And when we enter into Christ, and we enter into this place where we stop from trying to be good enough and thin enough and smart enough and pretty enough and, uh, you know, all of that, trying to be enough. God already says, all right, you're messed up and you're broken. That's why I sent my son to die for you. Because you can't be good enough. We all fall short of God's glory. Of all the things that we could do, of the best we could be, we never amount to that, do we? And certainly not enough to enter to heaven because the only way you enter heaven is to be perfect. And there's only one. And un unless, you're, unless you're in him, who's Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. So we talked about that, about ceasing from our works and not working ourselves up to being saved. And it's not about works and the rest is entering into Christ. It's not a place, you know, we usually think, I think about rest as being, you know, horizontal-ish, you know, and uh, with, with shoes off, maybe dressed in something without zippers and buttons, <laughs> like sweatpants and sweatshirt with a hood. Like a good nap on Sunday, maybe, after a big meal. You know, that's what I think of when I think of rest. But rest is entering into a place where you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to freak out and chew your, your fingernails to a nub. You don't have to nag people. These are all the kind of things we do when we worry. We can rest in Christ and know that the Lord's got this. And it doesn't matter what's going on on TV. God is still God. He's still on the throne. So, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. Jesus is the one who tells us to come to him for rest. And when you enter into his rest, it's done. Don't worry about whether it's Saturday or Sunday's the Sabbath, and well, what, guy, what day do you guys worship on? Hey, listen, I'm in, I'm in the seventh day all the time. How about you? Amen. Amen. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Now, he's talking to them as believers. Be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We have this really bad example of what it looks like to not enter God's perfect will of where he wanted these folks, into this rest, into Canaan. And all of their bodies fell in the desert except for two, Joshua and Caleb. And because they had faith and believed God, the Lord preserved them through all that, they got to the other side, and then there was a trouble spot in the mountains where, the, where some of the Anakims still were. And uh, 85 years old, Caleb steps up, and he says, I'll take it. Give me that land as an inheritance. I'll take it. I'll go fumigate. And he did. So that's what I want to be. That's a really good example of faith. And by the way, this is an encouragement about overcoming because there are rewards so much more than getting a right credit card. There are rewards when we come before the Lord, and he's actually going to honor us by announcing to everybody what it is that we did in him, not in our own strength, not in our own maturations, but according to what's in him. In fact, if you look at all the churches in Revelation from Ephesus to Laodicea, every one of them, there's a benefit. There is a blessing that God says he will give if they endure. Uh, eating of the tree of life, not hurt by the second death. Hidden manna, get a white stone with a new name that only you and the Lord know. Did you know your name is not your name? Talk about an identity crisis. The Lord's going to give you a new name. Anyway, 
Hidden manna, a white stone, a new name, that there's power over the nations. You'll have white raiment, that your name will not be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life, that you're, you'll be a pillar in the temple and a new name that you will sit with him upon. So we are to beware of falling and about disobedience as Christians. Well, I thought I just accepted Jesus and my whole life would be perfect. Yeah. No, not really. It's more like entering the military. Because there's a lot of training going on, you know, and, you know, we've, got to, we've all got to get on board and praise God for that because uh, I, I would hate to be the person I once was. So let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, it says, do you not know that all those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Paul is saying, don't you understand how this works? Not everybody gets a prize. Maybe only in America. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you know that all those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize. We're told run in a way that you may obtain it. By the way, it's not about salvation because you can't earn it, right? It's about sanctification. It's about giving glory to God. It's about living your best life for Jesus so that you can bring glory and honor to him. Amen. Amen? Amen. So it's not your best life now for you. It's for him. So run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things or is disciplined in everything. And you know, if you were in the Olympics, you would be, right? There would be no question of that diet. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. No, I don't run in circles. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. I'm not just a shadow boxer. I want to make connections. But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. What are you disqualified from? Not eternity. You're disqualified from the prize. You see, there are rewards that we forfeit when we decide to live like a bunch of schlubs. And we forfeit that. You don't want to wake up one day and realize that 20 years have gotten behind you because no one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. Some of you recognize the lyric of the prophet. Sorry. And so be careful of disobedience. You know, I don't know what the devil tells you in your head, but in my head, it's like, go ahead. You could have a bagel. No big deal. For me, that would be wrong. You could have a bagel with five pieces of pork roll and some cheese and two eggs. It'll be okay. You won't suffer any implications because the Lord will forgive you for your piggery. I don't know if you have that kind of whispering. Piggery is probably not a word you ever hear in your head, but I do. It's okay. It's okay. It's not that important. You'll fit into that airline seat, Dave. You will. <laughs> but maybe I won't. I have to be careful that disobedience doesn't begin to reach into my heart and start making a home. You guys know what that's like? You could start compromising it. It always starts with a thought, maybe a look, and a slight leaning in that direction. And then it's like, ah, oh, who cares? You know, and you just, and away you go. At least that's the way it is for me. And the scripture says, be careful of this. You can get so comfortable in your Christianity that you forget that your life's not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And so I'm still learning that, as you can tell. But I'm preaching to myself, so, and I'm listening. For the word of God is living and powerful. New verse, chapter four, verse one, no, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. What a strong scripture. How many of you have heard this before? The word of God is living 
and active, or living and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. If you ever do a study on the two-edged sword, it's interesting. It's all throughout, peppered throughout the Old Testament. The Word of God is living and powerful. How many of you have found this to be true? You read the Word, or you have a devotion, and then you open it up, and you go, oh, what's my devotion for today? And it's like, oh, whoa, the Lord knew exactly what I needed to hear. Some of you sometimes on a Sunday will tell me, how did you know? Say, how did I know what? Did my wife talked to you? <laughs> no, your wife hadn't been talking to me. Because I felt like you were talking to me today. Okay, well, that's a function of the Holy Spirit, not me. That just, that just means I was a good straw. Just an empty vessel, you know. But praise God. Anyway, his word is like a fire. It says in Jeremiah 23, 29 says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. They were a bunch of people who took religion in a really bad vein, and they used God's name falsely and spoke falsely on his behalf. And he said, my word is like a hammer. It's not like a feather. It's not there to tickle you. It's not there to feel you. It's something to challenge you and let you know what it is that's on my heart. And because they have stolen it from everyone, it's no longer like a fire. It's no longer like a hammer. Psalm 119, verses 1 to 176. There's a, there's a good morning devotion. You know, when you, oh, what's my devotion? It's Psalm 119. Oh, I got to be somewhere. I got places to go. I, there's a lot of verses here. But it's basically all about God's word and his statutes and his laws. All throughout it and how wonderful it is. But uh, it, so if you're looking for a good long read, like maybe I'm on the plane 18 hours, that'd be good. Romans chapter 10, 17 says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's word is the only thing where there's a promise that you will gain faith by reading it. There are a lot of good books out there. There's only one best book. And, and sometimes the good take away from the best. Isaiah 55, 11 says, so my word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing in which I sent it. I take great comfort in knowing that God's word does the work. I don't have to nag somebody into the kingdom. You ever try to do that? When I was a young Christian, I was like on fire for Jesus. I didn't know anything. But I, was, I knew I was made new. I didn't bear my sin anymore. And that Jesus had taken it away. I had a new life. I was thinking different. I was speaking different. I was walking different. I was acting different. I loved people that I hated previously. He was like, hey, good morning. How are you? I'm like, <laughs> you need the Lord. Yeah, right. What are you doing today, Dave? I'm doing Jesus, man. Mainlining. <laughs> I had a lot of zeal with no knowledge, not a good combo, but I can tell you that I was on fire to tell people about Jesus because I loved them and I wanted them to have what I had. You know what that's like? It's like, ooh, 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 pick me, pick me. I get the answer. And when you share your faith and you share the word of God, by the way, if you share your testimony, you don't know what's going to happen, but you share the word of God, faith comes. You share the word of God and it accomplishes that which he sets forth to do. Sometimes it's just to look at the videotape and judgment. You know, people are going to show up, stand before the judgment seat and give an account for things done in the body. And they're going to like, it's you. I had no idea. Nobody told me. Let's go to the videotape. Remember when this person came up to you and they quoted this passage and you felt that little bang and you just decided to cover it up with dirt and walk away, that was me. So sometimes God's word goes and brings faith. Sometimes it just brings judgment. So God will take care of what the meaning of it is. You take care of giving it out. Amen? Amen. Sound like a good deal? For the word of God is living and powerful. I want you to notice something. It's like the antidote for a lack of faith, isn't it? The word of God. Because very often, whenever it is that we fall, you realize we have to make a decision. And it's usually a reflection of what we believe. 
So if I decide I'm going to go off and do something that the Lord doesn't want me to do, it's because I don't believe what God has already said to me. You see? It's so simple. Except it's so dastardly because I don't have enough faith to trust God as word and so I don't believe it. And so I believe a lie and I go over here and then I do stupid things. Any of you experience that? Okay, about nine of us. Okay, good. And so I find that the word of God is the antidote to me doing stupid things. That's why I want to get my face in it and I want to know it. Psalm 132 says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above your name. That's a curious passage, isn't it? How did God elevate his word above his name? I thought his name was sacred. You're not supposed to use his name in vain. It's, you know, one of the, one of the big ten, right? Not take the Lord's name in vain. And yet he's lifted up his word above his name. That's very curious, isn't it? In Ephesians 1, 20 to 21, it says, For he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and all power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And whose name is that? It's the name of Jesus. His name, there is no other name given among men where we must be saved. And Jesus is that name that has been lifted up. In Philippians 2, 9 to 11, it says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. That's interesting. There are those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so we see that Jesus' name is like a big deal. And yet he has lifted his word above his name. Are you putting it together? I want you to notice something. The word of God is a hymn. One possible understanding of the scripture is like in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In verse 14, and the word became flesh and we saw his glory, the glory of the only one and begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word is Jesus. So whenever I see the word, never in this passage, but everywhere else I think of Jesus. And then I started thinking about that and saying, I wonder if this is what this passage means. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. By the way, that's what's of you, what is of God. And of joints and marrow, that's the stuff that's not even seen, where God can cut right between. And is a, th a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That sounds like the Lord, doesn't it? He knows not only what you're doing, but he also knows why you do it. Those are your thoughts and your intentions. And there is no creature, uh, creature hidden from his sight, his. But suddenly his is brought into the picture. None of this says his. And if you read it just by itself, it's not connected to the next verse, but the next verse is right next to it. Isn't that curious? And there is no creature hidden from his <coughs> sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so it sounds to me like the word is a hymn. Isn't that interesting? I just like to shake things up. And I've just read all this to you in John chapter 1. And it's very interesting that in the book of Revelation, Jesus comes on a white horse and there's a sword, a double-edged sword, sticking out of his mouth. And of course, everybody tries to be artistic with that, but nobody looks good with a sword coming out of their mouth. So what in the world does that mean? Well, it says that he will slay the nations with the sword of his mouth. And the sword of his mouth, it's the word of God, right? Revelation 19, 13 to 16 says, He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. 
And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress, the fierceness, the wrath of Almighty God. It's interesting, Jesus has a sword coming out of his mouth. And this passage says, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Do you see the connection? I'm glad I'm not the only one. Because sometimes I see things and I wonder if I'm just seeing things. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 to 15 says, There's no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, notice the foundation's already laid, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, that's the day of the Lord, will declare it. Because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work in which he is built on it endures, notice you build on it, the foundation of Christ, he will receive a reward. Notice a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. The picture is this. Christ is the foundation. Everything that we do in him is like building a house. It's this wonderful testimony in which if you're lucky enough, you will die in Christ and then somebody will read it in front of a bunch of people you know, right? That's basically your house. And they will give all the details of your house and your life when you're gone. And you'll be up in the front of the room and everybody will be facing you, much like you're facing me now. No other foundation can be laid. He's talking about Christians. He's not talking about working our way to heaven. He's talking about building in the foundation of what Christ has already given to us as a gift, which is his grace and forgiveness. And some of us, aren't going to do much with that. We're going to get into heaven through fire. And it's going to burn away all the junk in our lives, which means nothing. How many of you are glad for that? Because boy, there's a lot of junk. But then anything that goes through there, like gold and silver and precious stones, that those are the things that will endure. And that actually is a credit. And that's something that we're going to lay at the feet of Jesus, by the way, and say, Lord, you gave your life for me. And, and this is, this is what I have for you. Now there are going to be some people that make it through the fire. And on the other side, they're going to be putting themselves out and smoking and hair singed, you know, one eyebrow gone. They're just going to, they're just going to make it in, but they're in. And by the way, it gives you new clothes. So it's okay. Cause they're all dressed in fine linen later in revelation. So we're okay. But the, the point of the matter is, what do, you, what do you bring into the Lord? What has his salvation meant for the way that you live your life? And it's something that we should be thinking about and checking constantly, like, Lord, how am I doing? What can I do better? How can I serve you better? Are there things in my life I can eliminate? Are there, are there places where I can, I can sacrifice for the benefit of others? How, how can I serve people around me that have real needs? These are, these are the kind of questions we should be asking, I think, all the time, because we want to honor God and his sacrifice that he made for us on the cross. Amen? That is the heart of a believer. It's, it's not just me because I'm a pastor. That's the heart of a believer because God gives you that heart, and you want to serve him because of what he's done. There's no other foundation that can be laid other than the one which is laid, and we get an opportunity to show blessing and honor and give our lives for Christ and make it count into eternity. So I look forward to that. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. The writer is encouraging these Jewish believers who have come to Christ to hold fast, to hold on. You guys, you guys know, you ever watch Braveheart? Hold, hold, anyway. We have a great high priest. Those of you who don't know what a high priest is in the Jewish religion, it's, uh, you tend to think of a, a, a priest in the Catholic church if you come from there. But this is a Jewish high priest, one who speaks on, he speaks to God on your behalf. He has passed through the heavens. Jesus, who's the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. So the, we're told to hold fast. I don't know about you, but there are several ways that you can hold fast. 
um, I've noticed that my holding ability is not what it once was. Any of you experienced that? Yeah, all I have to do is hang from a bar. I, you know, all I have to do is hang from something for a little while, and I'm like, either your grip is weaker or you're heavier, <laughs> or both, which is what I'm always, you know, never surprised at. But we're told to hold fast, and if we do it in our own strength, we'll fail. Amen? Yes. New Year's is coming, if you don't believe me. The writer is always comparing what they had when they were in the Jewish faith and the old covenant with the new covenant, which Jesus introduced. And there's always this comparison and this contrast. And so he's comparing the temple with the heavens. Jesus as our high priest has gone into the heavens where the high priest on earth would go into the Holy of Holies, which is a, a place, a monument to God, which is built by the hands of man. And he's saying, which would you choose? a temple on the earth built by man's hands, or heaven? Would you choose a high priest who goes to heaven on your behalf, or another man who has identical problems to you, making sacrifices with the blood of sheep and goats for you? I would pick number one, which is Jesus. He's a better high priest. He's got a better temple. He's got a better ministry, a better sacrifice. He's better in every respect. That's basically the book of Hebrews. He's comparing the son of God to a high priest, which as holy and as reverent and as select as they are, they're still human beings, right? And so in my mind, I'm always thinking that there's a battle. It's a battle between Jesus and the high priest. You know, ding, ding. You know, you can come out of your corners and come out fighting. And so the, the, the author is always doing this and comparing the two as they come together. Jesus, as our new high priest, sympathizes with our sinful condition, but not because he's a sinner, but because he was tempted and he conquered. You see, a high priest can be sympathetic with me. It's like, uh, you're back again? Yeah, okay, I get it, no problem. Let's get busy. Get the animal out, you know, <laughs> you know under your hands and, you know, tied up. And now you're going to sacrifice this thing and this person's going to have their hands. Yeah, you sinned again, huh? Yeah, yeah, sinned again, yeah. The high priest shouldn't be like, you should know better. No, because you're a sinner too, right? But Jesus is a high priest because he was victorious. He was tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. And yet he has compassion on us because he knows how hard sin really pressed him. So he knows how hard it's pressing you. And if you think that there's no one on this earth that understands what you're going through, Jesus does. Jesus knows far more than you what it is to suffer. And so it says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Aren't you glad for that? We have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. And I'm grateful for that. That when I go to the Lord, he didn't say, huh, you again? You messed up again, huh? He doesn't, he doesn't treat me with any other attitude than I'm so glad you came. Let's talk. Because it's all about working that out. It's not about beating me down. It's not about beating you down either. So if you think you go before God and he beats you down, you got the wrong God. Make sense? So if you're interested in winning the battle, you have to ask the victorious one for help, right? And yet how often do we try to handle it in our own strength? I think of the song, you know, how often we shortchange ourselves because we don't take things to the Lord in prayer. Oh, what joy we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to the Lord in prayer. And that's just the way it is. And he's a compassionate high priest where we can go to and, and he will help us in time of need. such trouble these days. And so that's, that's the end of chapter four. And I actually thought I was going to do all of chapter five, but I'm going to jump into it and do some of it. Jesus is greater in every respect. And he's going to continue, by the way, you know, the chapter verses, uh, the, the chapters and verses are all put there by mankind so that we might be able to separate things out. And I'll say, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139 or something. So we're able to do that. But as you can tell, 
The thought continues on into chapter 5 from chapter 4. For every priest that's taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. That just makes too much sense, doesn't it? Some of you guys come to me like I'm special. And I guess I appreciate that. But I'm no different than you. I have struggles and difficulties just like you. And so if you're going to walk into my office and tell me what a dirty dog you are and that you need some help or you need some encouragement or you need a, a scripture verse or you need some wisdom or you need something, I, you got to know when you come in, I'm praying the whole time <laughs> because I am just as frail and faulty as you. The high priest, I would hope, would be compassionate and understand that even though he's a constant butcher and he sees people on a frequent basis because people mess up all the time, and yet they come there to make it right with a sacrifice, you can, that can get old, right? Do you, do you ever have people that get old in your life? You know, and you see somebody and you go, oh, no, I hope they didn't see me. Yeah, I'm sure you never do that. You walk into church and you go, oh, no. <laughs> I know what they're going to do. They're going to come up to me and they're going to want to talk to me and tell me this thing that I want to hear. And besides, I'm busy. I got a thousand things going on. You know how it can get old, right? None of you good people know that, do you? Okay. Well, I get that way. And sometimes I see you coming. You know, that's why we have caller ID, right? Do I have an hour and a half? Let it go to voicemail. <laughs> I don't have an hour and a half. And if we're not careful, our hearts can be that way. And yet, we're all the same. And if, and if somebody gets the guts up to make a phone call to me, I'd better stink and answer it. Uh, don't, don't try it next week or the week after uh, for two weeks. Because it's going to cost me money on my phone. Bottom line is this. We should be compassionate towards one another because we all fall short, don't we? There's no way that you can stand in judgment over another human being because you just don't possess the perfection to be able to do that. Every high priest is taken among men and is appointed for men pertaining to things to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness. By the way, do you know that we don't have any high priests anymore, but the, the Bible says that we are all priests. Did you know that? It's the, it's the doctrine of universal priesthood of, of all believers, where you have a calling by God to minister to somebody else, probably in this place here today. God has a calling on your life to be a priest in somebody else's life where you can come before God on their behalf. We do it often when we pray for people, right? You have people come to you and say, pray for me. You know what I try to do? Because my memory is going. I say, let's pray right now. I'm like, oh, okay. And I always get the big eyes. I don't know why. <laughs> Pastor, you can pray for me? Absolutely. Ready? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even tell you yet. I know, but I'm ready. I'm already praying. <laughs> because... If I say, okay, I'll pray for you, and I wait till later, I might forget. And I don't want to forget. I want to bring it to the Lord, and then I want to watch what he does. My wife and I had the benefit of uh, meeting three young ladies in our date night on Friday. And they took to us, they thought we were cute. <laughs> because we were holding hands, and, and we were just walking across a lawn. And one of them went, oh. You guys are so cute. I, that's a picture. That's like a postcard because I was holding my wife's hand. And, you know, it's date night. So we were, you know, we were dressed up. I wasn't, you know, I had buttons and zippers and stuff <laughs> and belts. And these, these ladies were at this place where we were. And then we went to another place and they were there again. And it's like, are you kidding me? 
And we're, we're talking like a 15 minute drive apart. And it's like, wow, what are the chances? And we got to talk with them and share with them. And we told them we were on our way out to dinner. And they said, well, would, would you mind if we came along with you? <laughs> and I looked at my wife and I said, well, it's really our date night. And she goes, no, it's perfectly fine. I was like, okay. So there's me with four women. <laughs> I had to tell you, I felt a little, a little like don't don't think the wrong thing here, people. But they were they were young enough to be my daughter. And, well, we sit down and we begin to talk about the Lord. We begin to talk about Jesus in our life. We begin to talk about the Jesus of Scripture, not the Jesus that they see on TV. And boy, what a great time we had. And there was one young lady at the end of the table who confessed some difficult things to me. And she just, some things she's struggling with. And she broke down in tears. And she said, would you pray for me? And I said, absolutely. And as we were saying goodbye to them, we went to hug them and say goodbye. My, my wife is talking up a storm. She took two of them. I took one of them. And we were just having a, a wonderful time together. And it came time to say goodbye, and we were, we were hugging. And I hugged this one girl, and it was like electricity. She suddenly burst into convulsive tears about what was on her heart. And I was able to pray for her right then and there. And you know what? I'm looking forward to see what God's going to do. When you enter into a relationship with people that may not know the Lord like you do. You have this wonderful benefit to be able to emulate him by your behavior. And if you are just absolutely blessed beyond all people, you will be the person that God enables to speak to them about eternity, about salvation, about having a relationship with God that's not based on your perfection. It's based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. That was one of the best date nights we had recently. <laughs> Being able to be with these, these three young ladies. Uh, two of them were from Houston, Texas, so I don't think I'll be seeing them anytime soon. And one was from Philadelphia. But we were able to minister to them and share the, the Jesus of the Bible and pray for them. And uh, I can tell you, I walked away changed. I'm sure they walked away changed. It was a, it was a wonderful time. All that to say, we have the ministry of reconciliation. We are priests. A priest stands before God on behalf of somebody else. That's what a priest does. A prophet is somebody that comes and speaks on behalf of God. So they're kind of in opposite directions. Not everybody's called to be a prophet, but everyone's called to be a priest. And you can speak the word of God to somebody and Speaking the word of God brings faith. It is the surest vehicle for people to believe in Jesus Christ if you know the word of God and you can rattle it off. And it carries the special promise that it's going to bring faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, by the word of God. And we can all do that because we're all called to it. So a typical high priest in the Jewish faith is taken by men, appointed for men, to give gifts and sacrifices. So, by the way, a thank offering is when you just say, I'm just so thrilled the Lord's done a great thing. And, you know, maybe you lop off 10% of whatever it is and you, and you give it unto the Lord. And it's a, it's a blessing. It's actually over and above what you would typically do. And you'd bring that to the priest and it would be offered up to the Lord as a thank offering. They're compassionate, but they're also subject to weakness. But not so Jesus, right? That's why Jesus comes to start a new covenant to give us a new high priest, which is himself. But he's not just the high priest. He's also the sacrifice, which is better than any other sacrifice we could possibly have. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or there's no forgiveness of sin. This is taught in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, that blood was required. The blood of an innocent would have to be shed for the guilty. And you go, what kind of a bloody slaughterhouse religion is this? All of that to be a shadow of ultimately 
God's son who would come and sacrifice his life for us. You guys all knew that though, right? Okay, good. So I don't have to tell you anymore. Ephesians 1, 7 says, and in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In Colossians 1, 14, and in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your savior, if you believe that God sent him to this earth to die for the sins of the world, and you believe that he is God's son, the son of God, and in his name, you give up the rights of your life and you say, I will follow you and do whatever you want me to do. If he's your savior and you've sealed that deal by telling him that, then you're one of his kids and you're adopted. Amen. Boom, just like that. If you haven't, you don't have that benefit. What happens is, it says that God sends his Holy Spirit into our lives and begins like a governor to kind of govern our heart and our mind and our lives and our behavior. For me, it was a nuclear powered conscience that I never had before. I used to do things and never feel bad. Hurt people? Well, shouldn't have gotten in my way. I wouldn't have run them over. You know, that sort of mentality. But when the Holy Spirit came into my heart, it wasn't that I cared so much what they thought of me. I cared how I was behaving towards them because was, that was I doing the right thing and when was I doing right by God? Did God think I was doing the right thing? It was a very different thing and I started feeling bad about things I didn't need to feel bad about. You know what I mean? You start questioning everything. Did I put the right color shirt on today? Does this not glorify God? You know, like, you, you start questioning everything. And obviously, I, I went way overboard into some areas until I learned what the scripture taught, which is I can rest. I can rest in Christ. And if I walk in the spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of my flesh. I won't have to worry about that. I'm going to cut it off here, guys. I want to thank you for being patient as I go through all of these frenetic uh, ideas and thoughts and all my little bizarre off-topic things. I want you guys to be good <laughs> while I'm gone, okay? I want you to be nice to the elders. These guys are going to work very hard to stand up here and to deliver you something that God gave them for you. Let me tell you, it's not as easy as it looks. You could try it sometime and you'll see what it's like. But you're going to hear from Johnny D on Thursdays. He's going to be leading Bible studies. You're going to hear from Carl, the tallest among us. <laughs> and you're going to hear from Randy. These men are going to take over from me when I'm gone. And they're going to deliver to you a message from God's word. I've, I've seen all of the topics and I'm looking forward to watching it myself. So... Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your architecture that you have put your scriptures together to enlighten us and show us who you are. And in so many ways, you have prepared the way for the coming of your son, Jesus Christ, so that when he came, all the pieces of the puzzle would fit together. And I thank you, Lord, that you came to be our high priest, the one who is worthy to stand and the one who is worthy to die in our place. Lord, I thank you for your love and your grace towards us. Help us to be those little priests that you call to go out to bring the message, to share the truth of who you are, that you might fill us with your spirit and that you might help us to bear fruit and it's not about our rewards for our own sake, but it's we want to lay things at your feet and show you our appreciation. So Lord, help us to be inspired by your spirit and guide us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.